My name is Irene De Biase, and I'm an assistant professor of pathology at the University of Utah, and also a medical director at AUP Laboratories. I share the responsibility for the Biochemical Genetics Lab. My talk today will focus on inborn errors of metabolism and the challenges that we encounter in the clinical laboratory in diagnosing and following those patients. I realize that our audience might not be familiar with inborn error of metabolism, so we will start by defining them and briefly reviewing when and how we test for them. Then we are going to touch on some key concepts of biochemical genetics testing, just to have a sense of what makes us unique in the clinical chemistry world. Then we will discuss some of the challenges we face, uh, particularly when developing tests using new platforms or to diagnose ultra-rare disorders. Immune neural metabolism are genetic disorders that affect metabolic pathways. They represent a group of more than 500 rare or ultra-rare genetic diseases. However, cumulatively, their frequency is relatively high. When we consider them as a group, they are a significant cause of morbidity and mortality in infancy and childhood. Most importantly, they are part of the differential diagnosis for much more common disorders, which overlap clinically but are diagnosed and treated very differently. There are several possible mechanisms that can cause a metabolic block. Usually, uh, inborn neural metabolism are due to the deficiency of an enzyme, leading to the accumulation of metabolites proximal to the metabolic block, lack of products distal to the metabolic block, and possibly accumulation of alternative bioproducts not normally present. A damage can occur uh, for any of those uh, mechanisms um, because of toxicity of substances or because of the decrease in products uh, such as molecules critical to energy production. From a physician perspective, uh, inborn neural metabolism are challenging to diagnose. Uh, most of those disorders are inherited as recessive traits, which means that carriers do not show clinical manifestation. And often, the problem is the first person to manifest the disease in the family. Because of the lack of positive family history, metabolic disorders can look sporadic and not inherited. Moreover, inborn neural metabolism are individually rare. So outside of a specialized center, a physician might only encounter few patients with a specific inborn neural metabolism over a lifetime of clinical practice. The clinical spectrum also is very broad and highly variable. Different disorders can present with similar clinical features, or the same disease can manifest in a wide spectrum of severity, with milder forms presenting later or atypically. Most importantly, early detection and treatment improve clinical outcome, so it's critical to identify those patients as soon as possible. Inborn neural metabolism can be suspected from routine laboratory testing, like an elevated plasma ammonia or an abnormal lactate level in the blood. However, excluding a metabolic disorder requires specific biochemical genetics tests. Those are multi-analyte tests that quantify endogenous metabolites in several different bloody fluids. For example, I'm showing you the results of a normal amino acid profile in plasma. This test quantifies amino acids and amino acid-related compounds and is used when we suspect a metabolic condition that affects amino acid metabolism and transport or the urea cycle. This analysis is also used for diet monitoring of patients with known metabolic disorders and for nutritional assessment in patients with non-metabolic conditions. Because of its clinical utility, this is one of the most frequently ordered tests in the biochemical genetics lab, but is also a very complex test with more than 40 analytes. So why so complex? Analyte patterns are characteristic of specific disorders. 
Analytes are affected by the patient age, diet, and clinical status, including treatment. So test interpretation, which we always provide with the numbers, is not based on the increase or decrease in a single analyte, but on the specific patterns of multiple analytes. Also, measuring multiple analytes allows for assessing several disorders, including ultra-rare diseases, for which individual testing might not be practical. Of course, we recognize the importance and the clinical significance of multi-analyte panels, but those are challenging tests for our perspective as well. There are differences in the analytical performance. Some endogenous analytes are physiologically more abundant, where others are essentially undetectable in the normal population, but reach very high concentration in patients. Because most biochemical genetics tests are developed in-house also, the high availability of reagents, especially internal standards, can be limited. The choice of the platform takes in consideration the performance necessary for the test, but there are also other considerations like test volume and runtime that will influence cost. At the end, we try to best serve the needs of the physician and the patients they care for. Mass spectrometry has always been a strong presence in the biochemical lab, but an increasing number of tests traditionally run on other platforms is moving to mass spectrometry. Especially when aided by gas or liquid chromatography, the use of mass spectrometry really increases sensitivity and specificity, which are very important for our test. Mass spectrometry also increases throughput, which might be critical for reference laboratories with high volume tests, like ours. Uh, for instance, uh, the gold standard for amino acid analysis is high ion exchange chromatography using post column derivatization with ninhydrin and optical detection. This is still the most common method employed, and it works very well. However, it has a long run time. So at one point, we were using eight different instruments to keep up with our volume. And so in 2013, we uh, decided to convert this test to liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry using tagging reagents developed by SIAX. We were able to reduce the running time for each sample from about 90 minutes to 20 minutes. And we we're working to further reducing runtime to 10 minutes. So we were able to go from eight instruments to only two instruments. And although time is of the essence, there were other considerations. Analyzed specificity by ion exchange chromatography can also be problematic. Compounds like drug metabolites react with anhydrin and interfere with the detection of endogenous compounds. Also, some analytes are difficult to detect because they co-elute with more abundant compounds. In fact, I would like to walk you through an example. Our case study is a six years old boy with developmental delay, high functioning autism, mild hyperammonemia, uh, but a normal liver function. This is a somewhat atypical clinical presentation for arginino-succinate lyase deficiency, which is usually presenting with more severe neurocognitive symptoms and liver involvement. In this condition, arginino-succinic acid is the K-analyte, and it is markedly elevated in urine. However, often physicians fail to order this test, especially if they are not suspecting this disorder. Plasma arginino-succinic acid and citrulline are also often elevated. But in some patients, citrulline is normal and arginino-succinic acid is not detected by ion exchange chromatography. And indeed, this was the case for our study, where citrulline is normal and arginino-succinic acid undetectable, the diagnosis can be potentially missed. But liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry comes to the rescue. The sensitivity and specificity for disanalyte are much better using LC mass spec mass spec. When comparing the two methods, 
uh, ion exchange chromatography is on the x-axis, while uh, liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry is on the y-axis. Um, at the eye concentration, there is a good correlation for arginosocinic acid, but the correlation is very poor at low concentrations mostly because arginosocinic acid is undetectable in several patients by ion exchange chromatography. You can see that citrulline looks great, both at low and high concentrations. Remarkably, using liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry, we were able to identify arginosocinic acid in all patients. And we confirmed the absence of this analyte in confirmed carriers and normal subjects. So at this point of my talk, I convinced you that mass spectrometry is the best and it will be foolish developing clinical testing using anything else. Well, <laughs> uh, developing clinical testing using mass spectrometry can be challenging. I will illustrate this point with another example, our pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy panel. Pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy is a very infrequent cause of neonatal seizure. However, it's very important to correctly identify those patients since they do not respond to conventional therapies, but they do respond to a high dose of vitamin B6. Pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy is caused by impaired activity of alpha-aminoadipic semialdehyde dehydrogenase, an enzyme within the lysine catabolic pathway. Impairment of this enzyme leads to accumulation of pipicolic acid, uh, piperidine 6-carboxylase, and alpha aminoadipic semialdehyde. P6C spontaneously converts to AASA. So those compounds uh, are diagnostic for uh, pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy and can uh, also be used for patient monitoring. We developed a method for the simultaneous quantification of AASA, P6C, and PA. We used the alterated uh, pipicolic acid as internal standard. However, the problem is that there is no commercially available reference material for AASA and P6C. So we had to synthesize the reference material in-house. And we observed matrix-dependent changes in the equilibrium between those two compounds that, remember, they convert to one another. So the calibration curves were prepared in matrix. And we also found that the sum of AASA and P6C concentrations, instead of their individual values, greatly improved the consistency in our results. The method is very robust and sensitive. Uh, you can see that the sum of those compounds is much higher in patients, even, even after treatment. This is clearly more sensitive and specific than pipicolic acid by itself, which is not always able to identify patients. So you can see in the bottom graph that some of the open square results from patients are within the normal range. However, developing this test has been really challenging. The availability of commercially uh, available standard can limit testing development for ultra-rare conditions. And this is important for us because novel inborn error of metabolism are described regularly. And lab-developed tests have to constantly change to include new analytes or to evaluate newly recognized patterns. However, we are very proud of our work. We know that our tests are critical for the diagnostic journey of metabolic patients. And we accept that that comes with the challenges of a necessarily high complexity testing. I would like to thank uh, the other medical directors in my group, they are wonderful uh, and very uh, supportive. And I would also like to thank our audience. Uh, thank you for listening to my presentation today on inborn aerometabolism.